CMRU School of Legal Studies, I would like to cordially welcome everyone to our fifth international conference. Previously, we have had addressed issues on international arbitration and last year, we had an international conference on international trade laws and its emerging trends. And this year, we are all gathered here again with an eminent panel to discuss the issue of bridging the spatial divide, problems and prospects of space industrialization. To begin with today's inaugural session, I would like to welcome Pranav from BBLLD fourth semester to render the invocation song. Jaya Ganesha Gana Nai Daya Yehi Jaya Ganesha Gana Nai Daya Yehi Sakala Vegana Kara Nora Hama A very good morning to all the learned participants and distinguished guests who are present here on this occasion. Over the years, the space atmosphere has grown immensely. It was for the first time an international convention that was adopted in the year 1919. And afterwards, the members of the international community did not look behind. They were way ahead and have been adopting several international con conventions to regulate uh, the space atmosphere. Now, in the situations like this, several conventions came in. Now, in the year 1928, one convention came. And afterwards, several of them, 1967 Space Treaty is a major step. Then came Astronauts Convention. Then came, before that, the Hague Convention, the Brussels Convention, all of them uh, have been able to uh, do something good for the benefit of mankind. But then we should know it was Arvid Pardo in the 1970s in one of the conferences pointed out that the area beyond the national jurisdiction should be declared as common heritage of mankind. Overnight, the young scholar became a hero and the principle of common, common heritage of mankind has been followed all through. 
But then today we receive rumors. And these rumors, if they are true, it is dangerous. And most of the states who are supposed to be advanced and they have the technical know-how and the research capability, unilaterally they try to intend to exploit a sport. They exploit the space and the celestial bodies. Now, this will not lead to good order in progress. Now, most of the activities thus far have been taking place with consensus and multilateralism uh, should prevail. Now, this is the background. And many of the participants, learned participants, most of them are brilliant scholars with an immense experience and the notable contribution that is made to the law of space are here with us. On behalf of the uh, CMR group of institutions, I uh, welcome our honorable chairman, chairman of the CMR group of institutions, Sri KC Ramamurthy, uh, IPS, and member of the Parliament, Rajya Sabha. And it is this man who is responsible in building up the institutions. And today it has grown immensely and with almost a population of nearly 20, 22,000 students from the lowest to the top. Now, I also welcome Sri uh, Registrar, uh, Registrar of the CMR University. I also welcome all the office bearers, distinguished deans, and statutory authorities of the university. Then, in addition to this, it is my immense pleasure to welcome, welcome the distinguished invitees to this function. More than this, we have two important guests. One is the, the uh, chief guest who is Armel Canest and who is Professor Emeritus of the French universities. And when you look at him only, you come to know that he is a scholar of such a nature and contributed so much to the development of law, especially in the aviation. And we are honored to have him. The moment we approached to Samit Sandeepabhat, he has agreed and he has consented and he is with us. On behalf of the CMR Group of Institution, on behalf of the CMR School of Law, I deem it a great privilege to welcome you, you sir. And we are honored to have you again. And another important person who is the key figure, as always, is Dr. Sandeep Abhat. Dr. Sandeep Abhat is a professor of uh, law at the West Bengal National University of Judicial Sciences, Calcutta. And he has, uh, right from uh, its LLM stage, infatuated with space. And he is doing and running a center on space law in the uh, University of uh, Judicial Sciences. And many of the uh, scholars who are able to make it are through his connection. And I also welcome you and also welcome you and thank you for delivering uh, it to be delivered the keynote address. Thank you once again. All the members who are present here, all the members who have joined for the group and to witness the entire session, all the members who are going likely to take part in present papers, and anyone who is left are also being welcome to this function. Once again, best wishes for the whole day. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your ever-encouraging words. I deem it my privilege to welcome our respected chairman, CMR Group of Institutions, Sri K. C. Ramamurthy, sir, for the presidential address. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this very important conference. Uh, Professor Dr. Arvel Karnest, Professor Sandeep Abhat, Professor Dr. Subramanya, Dr. Praveen, all the members of the teaching fraternity, all the participating delegates, ladies and gentlemen. CMR University, Bangalore is one of the few universities in India committed to the integration of enterprising initiatives and creative programs in the co-curricular and curricular activities. It is, in our ardent, it is our ardent pursuit 
of this unique objective that we continue to organize conferences, both national and international, on new and emerging areas of law. The School of Legal Studies of CMR University offers a specialized course on air and space law and is one of the very few universities in India which offers a postgraduate diploma in air and space law. In furtherance of its vision of providing a learning forum for scholars interested in this area of study and practice, the CMR University School of Legal Studies is dedicated to organize international conferences to host legal luminaries, afford scholars and practitioners a unique platform to discuss and deliberate on various contemporary legal issues and trends relating to this field. CMR University School of Legal Studies inaugurated the International Conference on Current Challenges in Aviation and Space in 2019, followed by the International Conference of Avi on Aviation Law in 2020 and the International Conference on Emerging Trends in International Trade Law in 2021. In keeping with this academic tradition, the CMR University School of Legal Studies through its Center for International Legal Studies is organizing an international conference today dedicated to space laws, the theme of which is bridging the spatial divide, problems and prospects of space industrialization. Friends, I feel space, which has been an exclusive domain for the public sector for many years till uh, very recently, is finally opening up to private sector in India also. The government's policies have enabled private companies, private enterprises to provide services pertaining to putting things into orbit, supplying materials to ISRO and other organizations launching satellites, among other activities, on a commercial basis. Satellites are extremely pragmatic and dynamic instruments. They are completely revolutionized almost all the aspects of human existence. They have impacted the way countries navigate, communicate, protect their borders, forecast agricultural production, and mitigate disasters. They are being deployed in the development of citizen-friendly Technologies such as over-the-top platforms, telemedicine, and smart cities, among other domains. Therefore, it becomes very imperative to understand this branch of law. And for the same, we have speakers from all over the world and India as well, who have closely worked in this area. It's a very important uh, area, which needs, uh, and uh, it's a fresh area. There's a lot of... Uh, 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 activities that need to go on in this area in the days to come and uh, the space laws need to be properly structured, organized and implemented in the days to come. On behalf of CMR University, I would like to extend my sincere and heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers who have got immense expertise in air and space laws for accepting our invitation to be a resource person for the international conference. I wish the international conference organized by CMR uh, School of Legal Studies under the dynamic leadership of uh, Professor Dr. Subramanya. Uh, all the best and the outcome of this conference, I'm sure, will go a long way in providing better and the required input and help in developing space law and related activities in a greater extent, particularly in India. Thank you very much. Once again, all the ladies and gentlemen and all the participants for taking time off to be part of this international conference. Thank you again and wish you all the best. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening words. For our inaugural address, we have with us Professor Dr. Arnold Forrest. He is an emeritus professor of public law in the French universities. He taught international public law, especially space law and law of the sea at the universities of Western Brittany and Paris 11. He taught in other French and Paris universities on many occasions, published books and articles on European and international law, especially space and law of the seas. 
He advises for the space law international organizations, governments, and companies. He is the vice chairman of the European Center for Space Law of the European Science Agency, the president of the Association for the Development of Space Law in France, the chairman of the Institute of Law of International Spaces and Telecommunications, Brittany, a former member of the board of directors of the International Institute of Space Law, a member of the Space Law Committee of the International Law Association, and a member of the French Society of Air and Space Law. He is a member of the International Academy of Astronautics and a corresponding member of the Air and Space Academy. It is indeed a privilege to welcome Sir for the inaugural address on the role of states in space law and space activities, evolution or revolution. We welcome you, Sir. Thank you. Good morning. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, despite the fact that uh, in France it is, uh, as you may, extremely early, <laughs> and uh, I'm amazed to see that we are having uh, a lot of technical evolution, but we cannot manage to change the fact that. Uh, uh, the time is not the same in front and uh, it shows uh, a rule which I always uh, tell my students is that above the human laws, we have got the physical and the law of nature, which makes that uh, for me, uh, I have to, to wake up during the time where you, you are already uh, having sun and uh, um, being in the full day. So uh, it, it's important to keep that in mind that you, we have the law of nature above the human laws. Well, for the first, uh, first remark, I choose to speak about the role of states uh, at the time when uh, private activity is increasing in the field of space. Uh, usually, and uh, since the beginning of space era, uh, states were paramount uh, in, uh, the, um, in space act activity. Uh, for, for many reasons, of course, uh, for, um, for political and strategic reasons, states are uh, uh, very central in uh, space activity. Now we, we see a change by the fact that there, there is uh, many uh, space, act space activity which are conducted by private uh, persons. Uh, then we, we have to, uh, to, to keep in mind that uh, it is uh, very well that private activity is developing for the benefit of all countries. Uh, I, I remind you of the text of Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty. Well, then uh, let's come back to, 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 the, to the beginning of space era and to our uh, Magna Carta, which is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Uh, at the time of, of, the, of this treaty, <clears throat> no private activity took place, only states' activities in outer space. And then, it, it, and, and, uh, and then uh, they decided, and for a, a central uh, decision, to accept private activity, but under the strict control of states. And uh, for the time being, uh, many are proposing to change, <coughs> to change the, this treaty and uh, uh, to, to, to make at least to make it a value, to make it change, and uh, um, sometimes to break it down as a whole. So I would like to just to, to, to keep in mind, to remind you that it is important to, to have 
a control uh, um, mechanism, a control legal framework, strong legal framework, in order to avoid having uh, a too important uh, disorder in uh, space. Uh, <clears throat> the first, uh, uh, first uh, I, I will just make a, a few remark, remarks as a, a professor of international law. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, uh, I, I will note that outer space is by nature international. It's like the high sea. In the high sea, you have no territorial jurisdiction. Uh, in outer space, we have no territorial jurisdiction. Even in the even on the moon and Mars, it doesn't mean that it is only because there is no land, but it is. Uh, we have no territorial jurisdiction because uh, uh, no state has a right to exert to have sovereign rights on celestial bodies. So. Uh, uh, if we have no territorial jurisdiction, doesn't mean that we don't have any law. Of course, there is law. For a, a simple reason is that law doesn't apply to space, to, to places, but applies to human activity. As far as there is a human activity somewhere, then there is a human law which will uh, apply. If it is not through uh, person through domestic, uh, through uh, um, territorial jurisdiction, it will be through personal jurisdiction because jurisdiction is may apply through territory and it may apply also by reference to the nationality of the persons uh, uh, having or uh, making this activity. It is already the case <clears throat> in the high sea. You know, in the IC, we have got the link between a state and a, a private activity. It is a flag or registration, and uh, it is the same in outer space. In outer space, we have <coughs> private, if we have private activity, which is the case currently, then we have to have a link with a, a state. Uh, uh, which is always the case. I draw your attention, for instance, to the fact that uh, uh, there is no, despite what uh, some, some tell us, uh, uh, um, there is no freedom of use of outer space for private persons. There is freedom of use if you look at the treaty and, and general international rules, because it's the same for the high sea, you have no uh, right uh, of use and the freedom of use and uh, 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 exploration for private persons. You have freedom of use to, for states uh, uh, and not for private person by themselves. So we, we have to, 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 to keep that in mind and to be sure that uh, we may have an evolution to the rules, but it would be I think very detrimental to a, a revolution in this domain. And I think that the role of state has still to, to be maintained and uh, that they have to uh, have a, a strict control over the activities, even if they are conducted by very rich private persons. Uh, uh, it is important for many reasons it is important for, for, for uh, implementation of the main principle of space law, which is in the beginning of the space uh, outer space treaty, which is that uh, uh, space activity should be conducted for the benefit and of, of all countries, in fact, of all people. And it's important to keep that in mind. If we accept that uh, uh, some very rich people uh, are going to uh, decide what they want just because they are extremely rich. Uh, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing to do with international law. It has nothing to do with law. So it is important to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, I will come to, 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 to the Outer Space Treaty and uh, uh, make a, a precision about uh, the, the role of states uh, within the Outer Space Treaty. There is two main roles 
uh, for which is a guarantee or which is accepted for states in the Outer Space Treaty. The first, the first one is Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which uh, make the states responsible for national activities in outer space. And it is, it is important to, to, to keep that in mind. If we come back to the drafting of the text, we have to remember that it was Cold War. And during Cold War, we had the opposition of two, uh, um, two systems, of course, two states, United States and USSR, on the, and, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, a competition and opposition between both of them. But then uh, uh, the consequence of this opposition was that international law was accepted. And the states wanted to have a treaty, which is the Outer Space Treaty, and accepted to have at least bilateral discussions. Uh, after the fall of the USSR, we had an important change, which makes that one state had the capacity to impose uh, its uh, will and to impose uh, the, the law as a, a applying to uh, international activities, which is a bit problematic, as we may see in the current dramatic evolution in Europe. So Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty uh, makes states responsible for national activities in outer space. It was an interesting compromise between the position of the uh, USS USSR wanting to refuse any private activity in outer space, and of the USA and Western countries wanting to, to accept private activity. So it is one category, which is national activity. And for them, those activities, uh, um, states are responsible. It means that they have to control and they have to authorize and supervise, which is, uh, indicate in Article 6, they have to uh, authorize and supervise any activity for non-governmental entities, which means that uh, it was uh, uh, for private activity. So the rule is still in, 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 uh, in uh, applies still now, uh, of course, uh, uh, because Article, uh, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty is, is very central in, in the uh, uh, in, in, in current space law. This uh, uh, rule applies to uh, outer space, means that uh, uh, all, all the orbit, uh, what, what Professor, late Professor and regretted Professor Bing Sheng uh, uh, wanted to, to call void space in order to make a distinction between outer space and the orbits around the Earth or, or anywhere else, and, uh, and uh, the celestial bodies. Now we have to, to, to integrate celestial bodies in, in, in our reflection, because of course, uh, as you know, uh, there is uh, more and more the will to, to use or to go back to the moon and to go to Mars to have uh, activity there, which is, for me, it's quite nice, quite, uh, quite good. The question is that we have to maintain some kind of international cooperation and international and multilateral discussions in order to, to uh, maintain a, a, an, a, an organized and, and uh, efficient legal order, which is for the time we have to, to accept the fact that for the time it's not so efficient and, and so international as it, uh, we may uh, uh, like to, to see. So uh, uh, this fact that there is a necessity of authorization and supervision of activities by states uh, uh, for, for private activities. It is quite important because it may maintain the fact that international law should apply to these activities. Means it should apply to uh, the activities on the orbits and should apply for the activities on the celestial bodies. It is important to keep that in mind and uh, not to go to 
the uh, the position of some and uh, especially somebody uh, having uh, important activities and wanting to go to the moon and to mars uh, uh, wanting to uh, impose to have his own rules on the celestial bodies i think it has to be maintained uh, under the control and the strict control of a state in order to avoid any uh, um, development which could be uh, detrimental to the world humanity. It is important to keep that in mind. Uh, the second uh, reason why uh, states are paramount in outer space is uh, the liability convention. At the beginning of the space era, during the, the building of the uh, space legal system, legal framework, we had uh, uh, the, the creation of the United Nations Corpus. And uh, I was, uh, uh, since a long time, now it's a little bit mo modified by the, by the pandemic, but uh, I, I was uh, every year uh, taking part to the legal subcommittee uh, as a member of the French delegation to uh, the UN Corpus. And uh, uh, we have, uh, at the beginning of, of the activity of the UN Corpus, one, the, the, there were two points which were supposed to be discussed, which was the uh, return agreement. It means the return of the astronauts, uh, which was uh, uh, making uh, the state uh, a little bit uh, anxious about the, 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 the rules to apply. And it was also the, uh, the liability. Liability of, of, uh, for in case of damage. I have to remind you that at the time, uh, at the time of uh, of the, the the beginning of space era, only two states uh, was really uh, having uh, important activities in outer space, and some others uh, like India, for instance, or France, or or China, of course, were uh, now involved in, in in space activity. But at the beginning, only two states were were taking part, and still now, only a few states are taking part to the space activities. And uh, if they, they, they want to, uh, to, to do something, then they have to, to make it acceptable to other states. Especially at the time of Cold War, they, they had to make it acceptable to, to other states. And uh, uh, in order to make that acceptable to other states, states not taking part to the adventure, then they decided to uh, have a strong and important uh, uh, convention, which was the liability convention. And the liability convention make the, the, the potential victims on earth protected. It is very protective for, for them. It means that, uh, and it's, a, it's a, the, the, the only case where you, you have such a liability, uh, such a, a strong possibility to indemnify potential victims, the liability convention make launching states liable for any damage caused by a space object as far as the damage is on the earth. For damage in orbit, it is not so, so, so good, but for damage on earth, it, the, the liability convention uh, make it very protective to, uh, uh, to victim on earth. And uh, we can see that it is an absolute liability it is uh, unlimited liability, no, no limit in amount, no limit in time, and, uh, uh, and even no limit for, for any, any other activity. If there is a, a terrorist uh, uh, making a satellite fall down, then uh, still the launching state is liable. So it is, it is uh, very protective. Fortunately, and perhaps amazingly, uh, uh, f we have very few cases of possible implementation of the liability convention because of technical reasons. That means that the, the, when the, the satellites are coming into, into the, the, the atmosphere, they are destroyed and the main parts are, are destroyed. And uh, another also another point is that in, in, uh, despite what we may uh, uh, see uh, when we are on Earth, uh, most of the earth is uh, the high sea, is the sea or, or deserts. So 
For the time being, we have no important accident despite the, the, the falling of a satellite uh, on, on Canada a long time ago. So uh, then we have got the liability of states. Not, uh, of course, it doesn't mean that private actors are not liable, but it means that there is a safety net, there is a protection by a liability of states, uh, a liability of states to be, to be sure that in any case, if there is an accident, somebody is going to indemnify the victim. And uh, it is also a, a, a very important point. Uh, it is uh, uh, to, to be sure that in, in any case, somebody is going to pay. Uh, if we compare to the situation of the law of the sea, we can, you can see that uh, the situation is a bit different because in the law of the sea, uh, we had the, this evolution which make what we call a flag of convenience. Uh, the obligation is the same. There is no, uh, despite what is uh, often said, there is no freedom of you, of, uh, of you, freedom of the high sea. Uh, there is no freedom of the high sea for private persons. Uh, there is freedom of, uh, of, of navigating in the high sea for states, just the same as in outer space. The difference is that in outer space, Article, 7, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty and uh, also Article 7 and the Liability Convention make states liable and responsible for private activity, which is, of course, uh, something which is different from the high sea. Uh, because it, uh, in the high sea, we had the development of what we call a uh, flag of convenience, which makes, in fact, uh, uh, some kind of difficulty to have rules because of this competition of states to lower, to, to diminish, the obligation of the of the private uh, um, entrepreneurs who may chose to find a, a, a way to avoid main uh, rules just by choosing a flag of convenience and states are, are some states are, are doing that which is for me not extremely good because uh, it uh, makes it difficult to put some rules in outer for in uh, in uh, in the high sea. Uh, in outer space, the situation is different. There is, for the time being, not a, a lot of states uh, um, uh, having the, 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 the idea of, of giving their flag, their registration to some uh, private activity just uh, in order to get some, some money, from tax. Uh, and so it, it is important to keep that as it is to avoid having uh, so, uh, not uh, rules uh, applicating in, in outer space. Well, we have uh, then some difficulties and I will, uh, I will conclude my, my uh, intervention by that. I don't know exactly what is uh, the time and how many minutes I have still uh, left because uh, we are a little bit, uh, uh, the, the, time, the time is not the same in France as in India, but well, uh, uh, then, uh, um, we, we have to, to be aware of the fact that there, we need some international rules in outer space for many reasons. Of course, the, the first, as you, you, you may know, is uh, for, for polluting outer space, especially for the debris issue. Uh, there is now a real trend, a real uh, uh, difficulty, a real danger uh, with uh, space debris. And it will be a necessity to rules to rule uh, the, the, the space debris and to try to avoid having too many debris created in, in uh, uh, outer space, especially in the low Earth orbit, where there is uh, uh, some uh, uh, risk to, to have uh, 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 the creation of so many debris that outer space may be extremely dangerous. And in some years, uh, even uh, blocked for use uh, because of the creation of, of, of the debris. Another problem will be to have a, a common and a, a, a multilateral discussions and creation of international law when we are going to use 
celestial bodies. Uh, we cannot uh, avoid having rules to uh, curate an, an, an harmonious uh, use of celestial body and uh, of its resources. We see already some states claiming, in fact, uh, they are, are trying to claim uh, 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 the resources, and in fact, claiming the resources, they are claiming the land. How can you uh, have uh, claim resources without having any legal rights, legal uh, 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 sovereignty on, on the territory? Nobody has ever done that. If you, you, you have a mine in, in, in India or in France, <clears throat> you can say that somebody is going to, to take the resources and say, oh, I'm not claiming for the land, I'm just claiming for the resources. resources. You know, for me, it's a joke. It's a bad joke, but it is a joke. Uh, uh, you cannot claim for resources without claiming for, for a, a sovereign right on the land. <clears throat> so we need to have some, some international rules. And uh, I will not uh, speak too long. Uh, I will try to respect uh, the time which has been given to me. But uh, uh, I, 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 uh, and then to answer the question whether we need a revolution or an evolution, I think that yes, we need an evolution of uh, uh, space law, but it would be extremely dangerous to uh, put outer space treaty out of the of the way and to change it uh, too too profoundly. Uh, we have to to try to have multilateral discussions, and it is extremely important to keep that in mind. I am sorry, perhaps I am old and I want. Uh, and I, I am uh, an old professor of international law, but when I see what happened in, in Europe for the time, I, I think that multilateral discussion and, 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 and uh, uh, international cooperation is extremely, uh, it is quite a necessity. You know, sometimes I feel ashamed to see uh, uh, what is the, the state of the earth that I am, and we are, we, the, the people of my generation, uh, are, are leaving to our uh, children and grandchildren. You know, I have many, uh, not many, but <laughs> some, some not, not a good situation. So my hope is that we are uh, increasing uh, 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 international cooperation and we are now uh, uh, entering into uh, 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 the will of having cooperation, international cooperation. Uh, for the time being, uh, I, I am sorry to tell you that I am not extremely optimistic for that. So thank you to, to have listened to me. And uh, now, of course, I will be pleased to, to answer questions if there, there are so. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. For our keynote address, we have amongst us Professor Dr. Sandeep Akhan. He is currently working as a professor of law and Director of Center for Aviation and Space Laws at National University of Geopolitical Sciences, Kolkata. He has the experience of researching on five major research projects sponsored by World Bank, ISRO, the West Bengal Judicial Academy, Ministry of Justice, and Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Apart from being a member of Board of Advisors of Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power and Space, Brunswick, United States of America, he has the distinction of being the member of the American Society of International Law, Baltimore, USA, International Academy of Space Law in Moscow, Russia, and the International Institute of Space Law in Paris, France. Dr. Bhatt has published three books on space law and three books on medical law. In addition, he has published more than 50 articles in the journals of international and rational repute. He has presented over 110 research papers in the international and national conferences, including the coveted International Astronautical Congress, as well as in international conferences held at Jakarta, Seoul, Sarjah, Singapore, Changsha, Paris, Austin, and Southampton. He has also had the distinction of being a member of Indian Space Research Organization's Expert Advisory Group for drafting the National Space Act for India. 
I now welcome Sir for the keynote address on space commercialization and legal regulations. Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairman uh, CMR uh, Groves, distinguished uh, Dean CMR Law School, and uh, my colleagues in uh, CMR. My colleagues and friends, uh, both uh, within India as well as from uh, abroad, uh, very good morning to all of you. It's indeed a privilege to be part of uh, this particular uh, conference, uh, which has been organized on one of the contemporary areas with respect to the space activities, the space commercialization or industrialization, uh, which of course is a hot topic uh, at present, then what are the legal uh, aspects relating to that is something to be uh, understood by every one of us. All of you must have heard of the popular saying that uh, science soars like an eagle and the uh, Lord drags on like a turtle. I believe that this is saying is very apt for space technology and space law. We can find that there has been tremendous development in terms of the space technology is concerned, but law is lagging behind somewhere. We are not having actually too much of developments apart from most of the 20th century development. We have limited developments in the municipal level at present with respect to the space law. In that context, let me just actually highlight on one portion of that, that is the space commercialization and legal regulation. I'll be only discussing about commercial aspects. Of course, there are so many other nuances of militarization and other uh, space related activities, but my focus is primarily on commercialization. <clears throat> to start with, if we look into the space activities in the 20th century, it has all, all been actually public sector oriented we find that the states were the major players and almost all activities used to be scientific activities in outer space. Exploration and use of outer space for different scientific purposes. But now what we find is a kind complete shift from the public sector activities to the private sector activities. We have so many private players, so many private companies which have come into existence for carrying on different kind of space commercial activities. Of course, by 1980s or so, actually, it was uh, quite evident that outer space can be used not only for scientific purposes, but also for different uh, commercial purposes. And that resulted immediately in terms of a uh, private sector investment. But despite this uh, private sector entry, one thing which we need to keep in mind, which uh, Professor Carrot has just uh, before mentioned, if we look into the responsibility and liability for any space activity, we can find that the state comes into the picture. Professor Carrot has rightly pointed out about uh, uh, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. We can find that for any national activity, whether it is carried on by the governmental entity or by a non-governmental entity, at the end of the day, appropriate state party is responsible for it. There is a state responsibility and they are, they are also supposed to authorize and continuously supervise any activity, whether it is governmental activity or private players activity. So this authorization and continuous supervision under Article, 8, uh, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty is absolutely required. Otherwise, if there is any wrongful act by the private players, ultimately the respective state would be responsible. Similarly, if we look into Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty, which is also supplemented by the Liability Convention 1972, all provisions speak about the liability of the launching state to pay compensation if the damage has been caused out of any space activity. Even if it is a private sector space activity, ultimately the launching state will be liable to pay compensation as per the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention. And for any private space activity, you will find one or other state coming within the definition of the launching state, because it is very wide definition. In even a state from whose territory or facility a space object has been launched would come within the ambit of definition of launching state. So every private space activity would also be in a way uh, at, attached to one or other state as a launching state. 
So given these factors, it is very pertinent to note that even if the activities are carried on by the private players for commercial benefit, of course, we have reaped uh, so many benefits out of this, like say our modern day facilities of uh, say mobile communication, direct television broadcasting, telemedicine, teleeducation, all these things have become feasible primarily because of uh, commercial application of all the states. However, the state's concern is that at the end of the day, it would result in a kind of an equation wherein the private players are reaping benefit out of their space activities, commercial application profit they are going to pay, immense profit. But if there is any damage caused by their activities, suppose if these satellites fall on some other territory and cause damage therein, ultimately state would be held liable for it. State would be liable means it is the fund from the state exchequer which would be going. So public in general would be paying for any damage caused by the private players. So this is the major concern for the state since responsibility and liability are attributed on the states even for private players activities. In light of this backdrop, there is a requirement of legal regulation of all commercial space activities. Even private players need to be regulated and Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty is one of the major tools for the purpose of regulating those private space activities since it says that every activity has to be licensed and continuously supervised. Now in this backdrop, uh, let me just actually, okay. The slides are stuck now. Let me try once more. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just uh, point out actually uh, some four to five major aspects which have developed in the wake of commercialization that need to be regulated, that need to be proper, properly regulated. First of all, I should tell you about the sale of extraterrestrial property or celestial property. Some of you have, you must have already heard about the availability of uh, the, uh, the land on the moon or other celestial bodies uh, for sale. There are different websites, like say lunarembassy.com and different, different other websites, different players who are actually selling the celestial property across the globe. That's a huge business which is growing, growing with respect to this. But the question is, who has conferred such a kind of a property right to those individuals to sell the property on the moon and other celestial bodies? Obviously, if you look into the space treaties, which all speak about province of all mankind, national non-appropriation, or even common edge of mankind under the moon agreement, there is a clear indicator of the fact that outer space and celestial bodies belong to everyone and nobody can individually appropriate it. Nobody can individually appropriate. Unfortunately, most of these private players argue that the moon agreement has been ratified by only a few states, only 18 states have ratified the moon agreement. It is not applicable. And if you look into the Outer Space Treaty, Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty only prohibits national appropriation. National appropriation. In other words, only state appropriation, not the individual appropriation. So that kind of a ridiculous argument is being put forward for the purpose of selling the celestial property to I should say that this need to be regulated at the municipal level because if you look into Article 2, the national appropriation under Article 2 would also include a prohibition on individual appropriation. Rafters never thought that a, a private individual can appropriate and uh, acquire property rights and sell them, but state cannot do that. This is not actually something logical. Plus, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty speaks about uh, the licensing and authorization from the state for every activity. So every private player has to take a license and authorization from the concerned state. How can a state grant a license for claiming property rights over the celestial body when the state then submitted under Article 2 of the Outer Space State? So I should say that in the municipal level, the states need to take appropriate measures to uh, prevent this kind of actually uh, ostensible claim of property and selling them to different people across the globe. Next, uh, next important aspect which I would like to point out is about the celestial habitation 
and of course another related issue itself resource exploitation so both of them together i will be discussing here there are lots of plans of uh, celestial habitation initially the international agencies like nasa basically planned for that now currently even the private players have uh, started thinking in terms of having the habitations on uh, moon mars and other celestial bodies but again a question is that doesn't it amount to appropriation when somebody is actually uh, say maybe establishing some kind of a habitation some modules or some constructions on the celestial bodies aren't they claiming any sort of a monopoly right over the land which is below that probably i can relate this to the presentation by professor garrett who basically already said that so he can't imagine about a situation where the resources can be taken and uh, the entity taking the resources is not claiming any land rights so that is illogical so once you have a habitation once you have a permanent settlement definitely some sort of an individual right would be claimed over these uh, areas of the land the so called land of the celestial bodies this is contrary again to article 2 of the outer space treaty and also article 1 for that matter because it speaks about outer space and celestial bodies being province of all mankind and they need to be used for the interest and benefit of everyone so celestial habitation need to be regulated and it has to be ensured that there would not be any individual claim of the rights over the celestial bodies another related aspect is resource exploitation once habitation starts obviously resource exploitation would also be the next step of course now even without actually habitation we are finding the developments in terms of uh, resource exploitation like 2015 the united states uh, has come up with the legislation for mining the asteroids and also for giving the property rights to the private players whoever is mining the asteroid can also claim the property rights over those resources 2017 luxembourg came up with a similar law middle east countries are also planning for the laws with respect to this 2020 us has come up with artemis accords uh, wherein they are planning for exploiting the resources from the moon and they are seeking for a, a cooperation by it should be regulated especially because we have already agreed under the space treaties that all celestial bodies and their resources are there for everyone common common right if you look into the moon agreement article 11 paragraph 5 specifically speaks about an establishment of an international regime to exploit these resources not a domestic regime or individualistic approach for the purpose of exploitation because they should be used for everyone's benefit so i should say that resource exploitation should not be on the basis of a, a individual movement like what united states did or luxembourg did or some other countries are who are joining the artemis accord are doing it should be on the basis of international regime and even copus is already working in this direction there is a special group which has been established for the purpose of uh, developing international regime and i i would uh, say that actually such a international regime has to be brought in at the earliest for the purpose of regulating the resource exploitation then comes the issue of uh, orbital debris space pollution or creation of more and more debris with more and more satellites and more and more space junk we are having the greater risk in terms of collision in outer space a lot of defunct satellites parts of defunct satellites are all there in the space you can find a very scary picture of our uh, earth orbit in the nasa website a lot of actually the debris you can find in the low earth orbit as well as in the medium earth orbit and each of these debris is capable of creating a kind of a chaos in outer space especially because even a debris of 1 cm as small as 1 cm can completely paralyze a medium sized satellite of 5 to 6 tons such a kind of a catastrophic impact it may have in the outer space especially due to velocity so we if we have more and more private activities more and more private uh, commercial satellites in outer space without an obligation to uh, remove the debris after the end of life of the satellite we will be having greater risk of collision in outer space greater risk of collision in outer space and unfortunately the outer space treaty is very weak in terms of debris mitigation and we need to have proper norms 
wherein the private players can be imposed with an obligation to remove their uh, debris. Another important area, or the last aspect which I would like to point out, is about the space tourism. A fascination which has already started last year, the developments, private players are all keen to actually step into this business, especially because of the huge stake involved in the space tourism. A lot many space enthusiasts have already signed up uh, for going to the outer space, but it crops up two major questions. Legal questions. One is in terms of sustainability. Already the outer space is riddled with so many man-made objects there, whether active or defunct, whatever it may be. If we don't regulate the space tourism, we are going to add on to the burden of outer space. We are going to have much more objects in the outer space and the risk of collision or risk of damage would increase by manifold by virtue of these pleasure trips. And of course, we have already agreed under the space treaties that the outer space and celestial bodies should be used for the benefit of everyone, not for personal enjoyment. So in light of that, how far space tourism, that to especially without any proper control and regulation, how far that is actually in consonance with the principle of sustainability with respect to space activities is a debated issue. So it has to be regulated in the proper way. Plus, there is also a question about operator's liability. Since I have already discussed that the liability in the space law, you can find attributed to the state. The launching state is liable with respect to any kind of a damage caused by the uh, activities. So this is problematic because the private players, uh, the space tourism operators, they will carry on the activities. And if there is any damage caused to other states or maybe even the, to the space tourists, argument of actually state liability might come into picture. Added to that, if there is a possibility of say unintended emergency landing of these uh, space tourist vehicle in some other territory, if we go by the rescue agreement, uh, there is a requirement of protecting and returning back the astronauts and personnel to the launching authority. They have to be returned back by the state of unintended landing and they can't even claim for the cost reimbursement. This is problematic because ultimately the private players, the big multinational companies would carry on this business of space tourism and responsibility would be there on the state of unintended landing to search and rescue the say tourists in case of emergency, return them back to the launching authority, even without actually cost reimbursement. This doesn't make much sense. So proper regulation of actually the space tourism attributing responsibility and liability on the private operators is also something which is very much. So with this, let me end my uh, presentation and let me tell you that unless and until we properly regulate these commercial activities in outer space, we are going to uh, see much more problems in uh, the space activities. There will be chaos. So in order to ensure that there's a sustained development in terms of space activities, we need to properly regulate both in the international as well as national. That's all. Thank you so much. So with this, I would now request Professor Dr. Vijay Praneshwaran to deliver word of thanks for the inaugural. Give it a great pleasure to be proposing the word of thanks for this inaugural session. It is not the end. It's just the end of the beginning. We still have a long way to go the entire day. At the outset, uh, I take this opportunity to thank our beloved chairman, Shri K.C. Ramurthy, IPS retired and member of parliament, Rajya Sabha, who in spite of his hectic schedule to make, uh, to join us and uh, deliver the presidential address. Thank you very much, sir. We are also grateful to Professor Armal Karest. Uh, France, it is up very early in the morning. In spite of it, uh, sir joined us and uh, shared his expertise. Thank you very much, Professor. We are also grateful to Professor Sandeep Abad, as always, closely associated with uh, CMR University School of uh, Legal Studies. Thank you very much, sir, uh, your uh, initiative and endeavors, and uh, we could host this. Thank you very much. And also, our beloved Dean, who is leading us from the front, organizing such great uh, conferences. Thank you very much, sir. A, a, a good uh, beginning to this international conference. Also, thank all the uh, participants. For, join, for joining in to this uh, inaugural session. Uh, 
three more sessions are there. Please join us. After this, you'll have a small break and then uh, please join us back for the uh, technical sessions. And also thank all the other volunteers and uh, coordinators for having organized and uh, taken this forward and made this inaugural session a grand success. Thank you very much. Thank you and all the very best. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end of the inaugural session.